after endless fake ghost TV shows, here at last is a documentary that presents the real evidence. Manu, are you there? Emma? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Manu. The experiments featured in this programme have been described by the scientists who witnessed them as some of the best evidence for life after death ever. We had a thousand hours of continuous communication with the spirit world. Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Three. For five years, the Skoll experiment continued to produce a vast range of extraordinary phenomena. More than in any other experiment in the history of the paranormal. It was witnessed by hundreds of visitors and monitored by a team of internationally renowned scientists and investigators. I must stress, it changes your paradigm. What they claim to have seen and recorded is so shocking that many will find it unbelievable. The table levitated and began to spin very rapidly. I'm not at all convinced that there is such a thing as life after death. In the US, we put psychic Alison Dubois, the inspiration behind the hit TV show Medium, to the test. Could she communicate with one of the leading Skoll researchers after his tragic death? Is there a doctor in the house? And we meet this woman. I'll just never be this age again. She says she can pick up the voice of her dead son on this simple tape recorder. We also followed the Skoll group to Italy, where they conducted seances with Marcello Bacci, one of the world's most unusual mediums. For decades, grieving parents say they can talk to their dead children via his radio. Although the experiments featured in this programme provide scientific evidence for the possibility of life after death, most of the public know nothing about them. This is the first time both the Skoll Group and Bachi have allowed their work to be shown together in a TV documentary. There has, in my view, never been anything like that at all, ever. In the mid-1990s, in the tiny English village of Skoll, one of the most remarkable experiments ever attempted in communication with the dead took place in the cellar of this house. The Skoll experimental group who conducted these experiments consisted of Diana and Alan Bennett, two of Britain's most accomplished mediums, as well as organisers and investigators Robin and Sandra Foy. Hi. 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 Hello there. Nice to see you. <laughs> For five years, twice a week, the group would meet in this tiny cellar. Here the Bennets would go into trance, allowing what they say were the voices of the dead to speak through them. Yes, we hear. Somebody talking. Somebody talking. Hello. Come on, friend. Come on, friend. Yes. We can hear you starting. But the Skoll group went far beyond this, achieving spectacular results in a claimed form of spirit communication known as physical mediumship. There's a wide range of phenomena that physical mediumship over the centuries has been supposedly able to produce. Uh, objects levitating, chairs, tables, objects in the room, apports and teleportation, in other words, things just dropping out of nowhere. <laughs> Sometimes things disappearing and reappearing. Apparent spirit hands, apparent spirit forms. Things that people can see happening. There's an effect on real objective things based on supposedly the communication or contact between a medium and the spirit world. The spirits are using the medium as a conduit to cause these events to happen. <sighs> Physical mediumship is entirely different from mental mediumship because everybody that's present at the time can witness what's happening. Such as if a voice comes from mid-air, everybody can hear and converse with a voice. Very nice of you to have us here. 
If a spirit person manifests, everybody can see what happens. I think it's fair to say that when you have sittings with physical groups as successful as the skull group, you will see miracles. You see things which cannot be explained under normal laws of science. Trying to communicate with the dead has been a lifelong passion for Robin and Sandra Foy. Today, they are among the world's leading experts in physical mediumship. What happened here during the Skull experiment was very successful and a dramatic effort which proved conclusively to us uh, that life goes on after we all die. Diana and Alan Bennett have also participated in physical mediumship for decades. They joined the Skoll experiment in 1993. But both claim their astonishing abilities began long before this. My first discovery of being a medium was when I was a child. I used to see spirit, I used to hear things and be aware of things that other people weren't aware. When I was young, I saw spirits spirits uh, that would come and show themselves to me. I think the greatest effort come from the spirit side. I mean, without them, you can sit there and nothing will happen. But a great deal did happen, more in fact than any other mediumship experiment ever conducted. And according to the Skoll Group, this success was due to the efforts of a group of deceased personalities on the other side. They called this group the Spirit Team. A Spirit Team was a team of spirit personalities who had lived a life on this earth. Um, several of them had been scientists whilst they were here. The Skoll Group say instructions on how to conduct the experiments were received from the Spirit Team, speaking via the mediums. Could you put your hand into the bowl, Some of the initial experiments involved photography. These began conventionally enough, with the foys being told to load a film into a camera and place it on the table. But after this, things began to get very strange. We heard the camera moving round over our heads, clicking and being wound on by spirit. In total darkness, so that in, in reality, nothing should have showed up on the film. But when the film was developed, there were amazing pictures. Wartime pictures of St Paul's, of a bus that was blown apart in the Blitz. Quite amazing stuff. It was never explained to us exactly why we got these particular pictures, other than the fact that we had a separate photographic spirit team working with us at that stage who were practicing their art and seeing what they could achieve. Some films contained images of faces, including human faces, in various stages of formation. There were a series that appeared to represent bubbles and various other things coming together, partial faces, etc. We were told that what we were seeing were areas of communication within the spirit world. The Skull Group believed these faces were images of deceased people, which were somehow projected from the other side. To them, this theory was confirmed with the appearance on another Skull film of this blurry profile. Communicators, through the mediums, informed them that it belonged to a man named Kingsley Fairbridge, who had died in 1924. We were put in touch in a very obscure way with his daughter, who was happy to agree that that was a picture of her father. In the next experiments, the Skull Group say they were able to create these images not only in total darkness, but without the use of a camera. We were asked by the spirit team to put a totally unopened Polaroid 35mm film just in its plastic container. If the spirit team felt that they'd achieved a result, we were asked to develop it. This could be done immediately in a special processing machine. You can imagine our surprise when we 
brought this film up that had never been opened, put it through the processor and viewed it, and there was images and faces and writing. How do you explain it was there, you know? In order to counter accusations that they faked these images, the group invited independent investigators to select the films. I checked the box, which was factory sealed, identifiable by the glue marks. He then broke the seal, signed the plastic film container and carried it into the session where it remained on the table. But could it have been switched? I'm 100% certain that the film I selected was the same film that was returned to me at the end of the session. The film was immediately processed in front of him. Halfway along the film, we could see a Latin statement. The spirit team had said that they'd worked on the film, and lo and behold, there it was. Do I believe in an afterlife? Yes, I do, completely. I had an experience where I met a medium on the street and she described my great-grandparents, my grandparents, uh, my great-aunt, who have all passed away, their names, the way that they died, and told me that they were all around me and walking with me and never really have left me or never really leave any of us. So, completely believe in that. News of the remarkable events at Skoll reached Italy, where the Skoll group travelled to meet one of the world's most unusual mediums. Marcello Bacci amazes visitors and scientific investigators who say they can hear the dead speaking through his old vacuum tube radio. This extremely rare form of mediumship is also called direct radio voice, or DRV, and is virtually unknown to the public. With it, experimenters believe that two-way conversations with the dead are possible. But could the Skoll group communicate through Bachi's radio? Manu, are you there? Emily? Yes. yes. Hello, Manu. Thank you, Manu. After this, scientist Harry Oldfield, a colleague of the Skoll Group, attempts further communication. We would like to ask the question of the appearance of your space. I can't really answer that. Can you tell something about Skoll? Thank you. Will the work progress? Certainly. Thank you. This is what I needed to know. Experts say that Bachi's ability to invite the spirits to speak through his radio is usually so reliable he conducts regular sessions. This seems highly improbable, but these grieving parents don't think so. The walls are littered with pictures of dead loved ones. Parents clearly recognise the voices as belonging to their departed children. Io sono certa che è mio figlio così come le altre mamme, perché i ragazzi quando si presentano prima chiamano la mamma, il nome della mamma e poi il loro nome. A parte poi che la voce è quella di mio figlio, l'ho già detto, quindi è inutile che lo ridica. Non Però nel tempo ho avuto delle prove che solo io potevo sapere e che hanno dato la mia, diciamo, la mia sicurezza di che questa, era, che questa era la prova che mio figlio era ancora vivo. For the bereaved, it's an experience that rescues them from torment. La mia vita è, è la nuova vita. Io dico sempre la vita di prima, poi si è fermata quando lui se n'è andato e ricominciata quando l'ho sentito. Diversa. We wish to know more with respect. 
But are these radio voices just a clever hoax? Not according to scientists who have subjected Bacci's mediumship to a battery of tests. One of the leading Italian investigators is Paolo Pressi and his colleagues from Il Laboratorio, an organisation that uses the most stringent methods of science to investigate paranormal claims. He is a, a, a medium. Surely is a medium because uh, uh, all happen when he is present uh, on the experiments. Using software endorsed by the FBI, Il Laboratorio have conducted voice print analysis. Like a fingerprint, a voice print is unique. It can therefore be used to determine someone's identity with near certainty. They compared voice prints from two audio samples. One was the voice of Shiara Lenzi, recorded before she died. The other came out of Bacci's radio after her death and was clearly recognised by her father. The comparison produced a 97% match. Despite this startling evidence, skeptics claim that the voices could be faked by transmitting them from a remote location. But Dr. Emmanuel Toriello, who has been investigating Bacci for decades, believes this is impossible. Dr. Toriello was present during key scientific experiments that he says eliminated any possibility of remote transmission. One of the first of these experiments involved putting Bacci's radio inside a special device that shields it from all radio signals. Yet still, the voices continued. I couldn't be more excited. Second point, the radio was switched off. And though the voices were going through. The third and main point, that the tube or the valves of the radio were totally removed. Still, the voice were going through. So you tell me how it's possible. Thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe in the possibility of life after death? No, I believe in a long, long sleep, baby. Back at school, the phenomena were continuing to progress. Nearly all of them took place in this tiny brick cellar, affectionately called the Skull Hole. It was here that the two mediums would go into trance, allowing what they say were deceased personalities to take over their bodies. Hello. But just how difficult was it to summon the departed? I think possibly we sat about twice a week for a year before we really got anything significant happen, you know, just minor phenomena up to then. But the group's determination and patience paid off. By 1995, visitors were reporting that the skull hole was alive with extraordinary phenomena. According to the Skull Group, their spirit communicators requested that they place this empty glass dome on their table. The glass dome was very important to the Skull work. Creative energy stored in the dome and was used by the spirit team to produce the phenomena that, that happened at Skull. In this remarkable photograph, the energy can actually be seen radiating out from the dome. But since these phenomena are so unusual, the group knew that without careful independent scrutiny, their experiments will be dismissed as fake. Therefore, the group allowed their experiments to be monitored by a team of scientists and paranormal investigators from the Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, based in London. For over a century, the SPR has specialised in examining paranormal phenomena in an unbiased and scientific way. Among its members have been some of Britain's most accomplished scientists, including a dozen Nobel laureates. Its investigators have exposed many fake mediums. 
they are not easily fooled. One of the leading researchers into Skoll was veteran SPR member Montague Keane. Initially, we were all pretty sceptical because what had been claimed seemed so way out. Another key researcher was Dr Arthur Ellison, an emeritus professor of electrical engineering and a former president of the SPR. No scientist of any kind would ever say that anything could not possibly happen. The third principal investigator was research psychologist Dr David Fontana. Professor Fontana is one of the world's most respected paranormal investigators. Paranormal is that mysterious area behind the seen and the known world. And since most of the world is unseen and unknown and most of the world is full of mystery, for me it's a fascinating and absorbing area. To preclude the possibility of fraud, these scientists were allowed to inspect the cellar and all its contents before and after sessions. All participants had to empty their pockets and leave their belongings outside. The cellar had only one entrance and this door was kept locked during all sessions. Despite these precautions, the incredible events at Skoll continued unabated and the SPR investigators reported what they saw in graphic terms. We saw coloured lights, we saw materialisations, we had direct voices, that is spirit voices talking from the air. We were touched by the spirits. We saw a whole range of phenomena which could not be mistaken by three investigators such as ourselves. In the spirit of openness, the Skoll Group allowed more investigators to scrutinise their sessions. These included leading scientists from several disciplines, even a professional magician. One of the scientists was the internationally renowned biologist and author, Dr Rupert Sheldrake. Science has done very little to investigate the afterlife or reincarnation. Most materialists assume that both of them are impossible. So there's a kind of dogmatic denial by some scientists of the possibility of these things. But I wouldn't say that was a scientific understanding. I would say that was a dogmatic, ideologically motivated dismissal. Um, the only way to have a scientific understanding is to do the research. We had a number of different uh, professors of different disciplines to come and sometimes they could test their expertise against the expertise on the other side. For example, Professor Archie Roy, who's an astronomer and specialises in the movement of celestial bodies, had a discussion with the other side about celestial mechanics. And he said afterwards that he thought there were only about half a dozen people in the country who would know exactly what they were talking about. Such evidence is gold dust to researchers as it is unlikely to have been fabricated by the mediums who possess no academic training in this area. Although the scientists found this sort of evidence impressive, they still needed to eliminate any possibility of fraud taking place under the cover of darkness. Therefore, the Skoll Group devised several controls to help eliminate this possibility. One of these controls involved all participants wearing luminous wristbands. These bands were attached with Velcro, so they could not be removed without attracting attention. They also requested the use of night vision equipment. We persistently asked them to accept infrared cameras, and they said not yet it would interfere with the energy in some way. So we had to accept this with great reluctance. We were told that this phenomena could be developed in the light, but if it were, it would take an awfully long time to produce, years and years, rather than a few months that it actually took us. Critics saw this insistence on darkness as an excuse to hide fraud. But participants to the Skoll experiment were not always in total darkness. Whoa, look at you! They were various shapes, generally like a pea-sized light, and it had substance. They would come and sit on your hand, and you could feel them. They were intelligently directed and intelligently moving, and would be responsive to our wishes, whether expressed or silent. The gyrations were sometimes so rapid that it almost left like a, a circle of light going over here and over there. Sometimes two lights would appear and just stare at me within inches of my eyes. I thought at first that the lights must be small light-emitting diodes suspended on the end of nylon 
fishing line. Then suddenly a light would start to do a tap dance on, on the table, bouncing up and down on the table and you could hear it click as it rebounded from the table and suddenly it went pop, went through the table and came out the other side. Now no nylon fishing line um, explanation would account for it going through an apparently solid, well it was a solid object, a table. The lights also had another rather strange trick up their sleeve, if I may talk about lights as having sleeves, and that was to pass through bodies. I was actually used as a guinea pig in the early days um, to see how it, how it felt and, and to develop the phenomena. Uh, and this light would actually enter through my chest and then three minutes later it would probably pop out of the arm or something and disappear across the room. This was being developed to produce a healing phenomena. I have this bad knee and at one point we had a light that was moving around the room and rested on my knee for a minute and suddenly moved inside my knee. Yeah, she just went into my bad knee. I could feel it moving around in my knee and then all of a sudden shot out the back of my leg and took off. The pain was greatly reduced and the swelling that had been in it that day was gone and, and that was a huge wonderful thing to happen. Visitors declared themselves delighted by these displays, but they were astonished to hear voices of what they say were spirit personalities talking through the mediums. We had a thousand hours of communication during the Skoll experiment. A, a thousand hours of continuous communication with the spirit world. Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Shh, shh, shh. Emily, when did you live on the Earth? Oh, a long time ago now. 19th century? Yes. In this dramatic form of spirit communication, the mediums go into trance during which time, they say, spirits take over their bodies and speak through them. It's the love that yes. connects people, right. Right. and the rest doesn't matter a jot. So what's it like to supposedly talk to the dead in this way? It becomes very natural, and actually talking to somebody who, who is deceased, if you like, is a natural thing, purely and simply because it's the same as you talking to me here in this room at this very moment. There's no difference other than the fact that we are aware that they're no longer in this world. And not be frightened in any way. But could the mediums have just been acting? The researchers didn't think so. The voices were quite different from those of the mediums themselves and the personalities behind the voices were not only quite different, but were very consistent. Even the accents were. But it wasn't just the consistency of the accents that impressed the researchers. They reported that the personalities also remembered every detail of all conversations spoken to visitors over a five-year period. Add to those skills the ability to read minds. This apparently occurred when a female spirit spoke to the group. She would tell us what was going to happen. She would comment on what we were doing and sometimes what we were thinking. She would answer our questions quite frequently before we had actually asked them, uh, which was quite embarrassing sometimes. Thank you for your warm appreciation of what we're trying to do. This communicator identified herself as the spirit of a Mrs Emily Bradshaw. And Mrs. Bradshaw, who was a very commanding figure, um, a lady of um, you know, the upper class Victorian or Edwardian lady, or she sounded like that. We continue from our side of life to influence people still in the body. But what evidence was there that these voices were really from the deceased? We knew that we were communicating with deceased personalities because a number of people who communicated with us were able to be identified by independent witnesses at the time uh, who could testify as, as, as to them being people they knew, evidence which couldn't possibly have been known by anybody else. But what's it like for the mediums to have these ethereal communicators speak through them? Those sensations become more and more intense and build up to a point where I feel the personality actually taking part of my senses over. I become more and more unaware of my own body and also more and more unaware of my own thoughts. My mother died about a year and a half before my father did and 
three days before my father died, he saw a vision of my mother and was very disturbed when she suddenly disappeared. And I believe that his death coincided with that vision of her and wanting to see her again. Back at school, visitors reported seeing and especially hearing these objects materialize from out of nowhere. In the language of physical mediumship, these objects are called apports. An apport is an object um, which is quite solid, which is brought from one location to another during an experimental session, but in so doing apparently passes through solid walls, doors, etc. Well, the total number of apports that we had um, during the experimental sessions was about 80 or even more. Whilst we were sitting here, this object would arrive, just materialise, and arrive on the table. But as it arrived, that's the sort of noise it would make. Despite the fact that witnesses heard a loud bang every time an apport arrived, no matter how small, sceptics have dismissed this phenomenon as objects merely thrown into the air. But the appearance of these apports are not so easy to explain away. These newspapers arrived in pristine condition, despite having originated in the 1940s. But who might have sent it to the Skoll Group, and why? The answer arrived, they say, when dead British medium Helen Duncan spoke to them via one of the mediums. During World War II, Duncan's life was ruined when she was arrested and imprisoned for practicing mediumship. As she described her ordeal to the group, this newspaper allegedly appeared out of nowhere. To their astonishment, displayed prominently on its front page, was the story of Duncan's trial and conviction. I think she suffered greatly through her mediumship, and she was really coming to wish us well, and she bought the newspaper as a sign of a very turbulent time in her life. The scientists knew that an old newspaper could easily be copied and printed onto modern paper, so Montague Keane had the suspect newspaper analysed. We took it to the leading research station in England, indeed in the world, on paper and printing, and it was absolutely clear from their report that, first of all, it was done on letterpress, which has gone out of uh, existence virtually since the early 1970s, I would say. It was newsprint produced during wartime, which lacked certain chemicals, which you couldn't get hold of. So this was a genuine article which appeared 50 years after the event, but no one has been able to explain how it got there. So where did all these apported objects come from? We were told by the spirit team that they were never stolen, but were basically objects that had been lost or discarded, or at one time been owned by the, the spirit personality that brought them for us. Back in Italy, we were given unique access to film one of Bacci's private seances. But Tim, now you have to sit somewhere and sit. Not in my back. Not in my back. Somewhere that you can, yes. Despite the loss of this camera, we were allowed to continue using this night shot camera to record the seance, which took place in total darkness. <laughs> As the seance progressed, the medium went into trance. <laughs> we were hoping to capture what visitors to Skoll said they had witnessed, the levitation of solid objects. However, minutes later, we were asked to switch off the night shot camera. But secretly... We kept it running. And what we captured was truly astonishing. This heavy oak table rose into the air. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 
But levitations were not the only phenomena we witnessed during these seances. Like the skull experiment, visitors to Bachi's centre say they have received apported objects. This woman is one of them. Questo è un apporto che ho ricevuto al centro Bacci. Al centro Bacci succedono spesso queste cose ed è incredibile. Uno potrebbe dire uno le hanno messi là, se lo sono inventati, ma non è così, perché chi l'ha vissuto sa che questo è vero. Once again, we were permitted to use night shot cameras in the hope of capturing the arrival of an apport. We were not disappointed. With the medium in trance, the camera crew were astonished when, out of nowhere, they felt these flowers falling on them. With the lights on, people reacted in amazement at just how many flowers had appeared. This one he has gone in his head. I'm mad. I'm mad. Si, si. Così. Così, proprio in mano. Così. As they collected them, we continued our filming. Although we saw no signs of trickery, this seance was not conducted under controlled conditions. Therefore, critics could claim it was possible for someone to have thrown the flowers into the room. But apports which have a specific connection to departed loved ones frequently appear at the centre. Connections that Baci has no previous knowledge of. Sempre la prima sera. Mi è arrivato un apporto, una foglia di giada di questa grandezza, identica alla foglia che mio figlio aveva sulla tuta della foto che io ho portato quella sera per far conoscere mio figlio, ma che nessuno ancora aveva mai visto. Identica. This woman said that a single red rose was apported into her hand. She was also convinced it came from her dead son, because every week, she told us, she placed an identical flower on his grave. As impossible as it sounds, could this rose really have been sent from the other side? I'm not sure that I do believe in the afterlife. I think it's because... I'd like to have final rest when I die rather than have to think about coming back as something else. Back at school, the phenomena were continuing to progress. The scientists were about to experience something even more shocking. Another thing that happened was that a hand materialised and sort of glowed. And there was this disembodied hand floating around. When I told some of my friends about it, they said it sounded just like the Adams family. And I commented to the medium, I said, oh, I can see a disembodied hand. And she said, it's not disembodied. This was Mrs. Bradshaw, who was speaking through one of the mediums. And I said, you mean there's an invisible body attached? And she said, precisely. And then she said, would you like it to touch you? And I said, yes. So she said, well, ask it. So I said, hand, will you touch me? And so the hand went round behind me and it tapped me on the shoulder. But could these hands have been hoaxed? This visitor who felt the truncated length of a disembodied arm didn't think so. And I was so startled, I moved my hand and it traveled right up a sleeve. There was a sleeve, like a cotton sleeve, very much like this, right up to the shoulder, and then it just stopped. There was nothing beyond the sh where the shoulder would have been. It was a really amazing experience. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yes, Oh, I see. Yes. Sometimes we would be touched by these hands. Sometimes we would invite them to touch us. Sometimes they would touch us on our knees, let's say, or on our feet, which, as it was a fraud-proof table, were inaccessible to the mediums themselves. So what's it like to touch one of these spirit hands? It felt um, cool, but not cold. 
Uh, it didn't feel clammy, it didn't feel slimy, it felt like a normal human hand, and it grasped my hand firmly. The unseen communicators told the scientists that they usually materialised a hand or an arm because it was easier than materialising a full body. But some cases of full bodies being materialised were reported. I had the presence, the physical presence, of my mother, my father and my sister, all in solid form, standing in front of me, all of whom I was able to, to hold, to embrace, uh, carry out conversations with them. I've witnessed it so many times, it, it just becomes a, a, a normal thing. Normal is a word strained by the experiences of the Skoll experiment. And there was nothing normal when patches of light floated over the scientists' heads and slowly changed into spectral forms. The diffuse patches of light would take the form just of a human face, moving round the room with the direct voice, very, very faintly, coming from the diffuse patch of light and the, the lips moving again very faintly. As I stared at the face, it was noticeably smaller than a normal size head. But within the face itself, features were clearly visible. We could see the glistening of the eyes, we could see the eyes moving. And even more remarkable forms were to appear. They looked like angelic forms. And I was very fortunate that one came and landed on my hand. and just the energy that you felt from it when it connected with you it was a lovely experience and it, it just felt like an overwhelming feeling of love. These were great experiences, you see. Again, I must stress, it changes your paradigm. You go in thinking none of this can be true, but after experience, after experience, after experience, it gradually dawns on you, hey, there's something going on here that we can't explain by normal scientific laws, but which nevertheless exists. Years ago, I was staying in this old, very old inn, and I actually saw somebody come out from the wall and walk through and just disappear again. And I just believe there are people that are trapped between here and the next world. The experiments featured in this programme have been described by the scientists who witnessed them as some of the best evidence for life after death ever. After two years of intense effort, the Skoll experiment began to produce more phenomena than in any mediumship experiment in the history of the paranormal. Their initial claims were that they were in contact with a group of deceased entities who were producing, with their help, a number of pictures of either deceased persons or strips of films, uh, which they claimed to be produced without any cameras and in the dark. To eliminate any possibility of hoaxing, the scientists brought their own film and locked it in a specially designed security box. The box was held in the hands of the investigators so that no one could get at it. And then immediately afterwards, we would take it out of the box ourselves so that no one else touched it and then develop it ourselves in a special machine. Despite all these precautions, the experiments continue to produce the incredible images seen here. They were able to achieve whole lengths of film sometimes up to as much as four feet, with various words, symbols, messages, all sorts of different things on that film. Other films contained poems in centuries-old German and fragments of Greek, Chinese, Hebrew, Latin and even Sanskrit. The Skoll group were ordinary people with no knowledge of these languages. But 
did these films have a purpose? If dead personalities were producing these images, why did they apparently design some of them as complex puzzles? Providing something which is a puzzle, which is difficult to solve, is simply because it is difficult to solve, it isn't readily available, it can't be easily attributable to the person sitting around the table. Despite lengthy investigations, the possible authors of some of the films, like this German poem, proved impossible to trace. But others were easier to track down. This one contains a poem by Frederick Myers. Intriguingly, Myers was one of the founders of the SPR and a passionate researcher into the evidence for life after death. Before he died in 1901, he promised his colleagues at the SPR that he would try to communicate with them from the other side. Could this film actually represent evidence of the afterlife sent by one of its greatest investigators? Mostly the researchers were unclear as to who might have created these films. However, there were clues as to who the ghostly authors might be in the form of initials or signatures. For example, in this film, the signature appears to belong to the dead singer and actor Ivor Novello. This was received on one of the Skull films. Compare it to Novello's actual signature. Investigators say these images were created in total darkness. But how? I think that those pictures can be explained only by imagining that the spirits can project their recollections and images onto a film in some way we can't begin to understand. The only alternative explanation is they are all fakes, and I don't believe that there's evidence that that is the case. Although the mechanism for their creation remains a mystery, investigators concluded they were unique. As far as the photographic evidence is concerned at Skull, the strips of film, there has, in my view, never been anything like that at all, ever. As far as I'm aware, I don't think there is any scientific evidence for life after death. Spurred on by the photographic experiments, the Skoll Group began a series of video experiments called Project Alice, after Alice through the looking glass. Their ambition was nothing less than to try and capture moving images sent from the spirit world. The Skoll Group insists that instructions on how to position the camera and mirrors came from their spirit communicators. They were told to set up a video camera in the dark cellar aim it at a pair of mirrors so that it could only film its own viewfinder. While it was recording, nothing unusual was seen. But when the tape was played back, these remarkable pictures appeared. We had images on the video, sometimes of what looked like um, a tunnel of light. Other times, spirit faces were coming towards us. Sometimes what appeared to be a doorway moving. Skeptics claim these images were created by video feedback, occurring when a camera records its own output. But scientists have ruled this out. Video feedback doesn't produce this kind of result. As to what these extraordinary pictures represent, we can only guess, since their meaning was never explained to the Skoll group. This video, also totally unexplained, appears to be a ghostly face with moving eyes. Later, a few video experiments were attempted in full light. Again, nothing unusual was seen during the recording. However, on playback, this unworldly figure appeared. But was it possible for the Skull Group to have faked these images? Not according to the investigator who monitored these experiments, Swiss lawyer and businessman, Dr. Hans Scheer. There's 
absolutely no possibility that this film could have been prepared before because I selected one of the video films which was in the original packaging which I opened. I took the film out, I signed the film and I put it personally in the video camera. He inserted it into the camera. We never touched at any stage the camera or the film. When we played the, the film, it showed at the beginning a number of bubbles of various colors. But there was one particular bubble on there in which the face of a person appeared, and it was a man with spectacles. Although Dr. Scher did not recognize this face, the Skull Group thought it might have belonged to someone who was trying to communicate with him from the afterlife. Uh, I have heard of the electronic voice phenomenon, and I think it's actually one of the most disturbing and unnerving aspects of the notion of there being an afterlife. Attempting to capture spirit voices via technical devices like radios and tape recorders has a long tradition that goes back to the last century. Today, there are tens of thousands of people around the world who say they have captured the voices of the dead on simple tape recorders. This is known as the electronic voice phenomena, or EVP, and was recently popularized in the Hollywood blockbuster White Noise. Despite the Hollywood treatment, EVP has been the focus of serious scientific investigation. One of the leading researchers is Alexander McRae, an electronics engineer who has worked on communication systems for the space shuttle. He has been investigating EVP for decades. If somebody came up to me in the street and said, there's nothing paranormal about EVP, I would say, well, I've done at least 20 years and hundreds of experiments, and I know that it is a paranormal effect. Now, how many experiments have you done? But skeptics insist that EVP is nothing more than the random pickup of broadcast signals like radio and TV. To test this theory, McRae tried to obtain EVP inside a laboratory that was fully shielded against radio and sound waves. This meant it was impossible to pick up any stray broadcast signals. So inside the laboratory, you couldn't pick up anything. But yet the device still produced voices. Although this audio sample is hard to understand, the very fact it was recorded defies all known laws of science. One experimenter of EVP is Vicky Talbot, who lost her son Braden in a boating accident in 2001. OK, I'm coming down into Wildcat Cove right now, which is the cove that my son departed from and did not return. Ever since then, she says she can record and recognize his voice using this digital recorder. Well, that's Braden. What has really convinced me is the way he speaks, the stress, the intonation. Sometimes he sounds exactly as he did in life. Happy New Year. He will use certain phrases that we used to use. He will say certain things that will identify himself as the person that he was in life. I am convinced, personally, that I am communicating with my son. Like visitors to school and to Bachi Center, EVP practitioners find comfort in the belief that they can still communicate with loved ones. But even this conviction can't make up for the unbearable burden of losing a child. These just make me want to cry, just looking at him. 
I'll just never be this age again. Or do that again. What matters is the love that you have for your family. That's what really matters. And not to screw it up. And to remember they can be gone in a flash. You know, these other people, I feel so sorry for them because they have no way of communicating with those that they have lost. And they go around thinking, if only, if only, if only. I don't have to think that. And that's a good thing. Although EVP provides some comfort to the bereaved, practitioners say that the voices are often unclear, always one way, and frustratingly short. One way that we also communicated with spirit, and which was a very effective way, um, was by use of an ordinary, very cheap tape recorder whose amplifiers were used by the spirit team to carry on a two-way conversation with us. We inspected this machine and found it was completely normal. Earlier, its built-in microphone had been removed to eliminate the possibility of recording anything. When the machine, which contained a blank cassette, was activated, witnesses were astonished when they heard this voice asking them a question. The Skull Group say that their spirit communicators suggested ways of improving their experiments. For example, they told Professor Ellison, one of the SPR scientists, how to build a device for boosting communications via the tape recorder. But this information arrived in a very strange way. These images appeared after an unexposed film locked in the security box was later processed by the scientists. The scientists speculated about who was providing this technical information. Then initials at the end of the film seemed to have solved this mystery. I wrote to the uh, Edison Memorial people in America and they sent me a copy of one of his letters which contained his initials which looked almost identical to the signature on this film. This matching set of initials convinced the researchers it was Thomas Edison providing this information. Not only was Edison the world's most famous inventor, he also had an enormous interest in the possibility of an afterlife. His intention to build a machine that could communicate with the dead made headlines around the world, but he died before being able to build it. Is it possible that through the Skoll Group, he finally achieved this aim? My understanding of life under de after death is what we've done here, the way we've affected the people about us and things that we do, and it lives on through them. Spirit voices speaking through the mediums. Spirit communication written on sealed film in locked boxes. All these incredible phenomena. But could the scientists have been tricked? Skeptics are often unaware of the amount of experience and the amount of knowledge that goes into investigations of this kind. Between the three investigators, you could say we'd had 50 years and more. We know all the tricks. I don't see how it could be faked. It's impossible. Nevertheless, was it possible for the Skoll Group to have perpetrated a massive hoax? These things are so extraordinary that when one tells them to people who've not had the experiences themselves, they think oh, it must be trickery. And the challenge then always is, OK, you duplicate it. But so far, no one has been able to do this. Nevertheless, critics still claim that the events at Skoll were produced by the kinds of conjuring tricks used by stage magicians and entertainers. As you find them 
You're saying the Minis Man are like this, you see? Because professional magicians learn all the skills of illusion and misdirection. I'm not going to show you how it's done, because if I showed you how it was done, you'd tell everybody else. They are also well qualified to detect this type of fraud. Hey, presto. With that in mind, James Webster was invited to scrutinise a number of Skoll sessions. Webster is a member of the Magic Circle in Britain and has been a professional magician for over 40 years. Well, I had an opportunity to view the cellar. I could see no magic props or anything which made me feel inclined to think there was any hoaxing or, or trickery. But could he replicate the events at school? I could not do it myself as a professional magician. And I don't believe in any magician that uh, I knew could do even the lighting, let alone the other phenomena that I witnessed. Any one of those in the cellar, I'd say they were wasting their time doing this here for nothing and they could be earning <laughs> a million dollars out there on the stage. In 1999, after an exhaustive two-year investigation, the investigators published their conclusions in the SPR's official proceedings. They were looking for evidence of a hoax. They sifted evidence for signs of fakery. But did they find it? If you take all the phenomena within the whole of the Skoll experiment over two years while we were there, I would say that the possibility of fraud and faking was nil. Although the Skoll report includes theoretical discussions about how individual phenomena might have been faked, the chief investigators concluded that events at Skoll cannot be explained either by known scientific laws or by trickery. But psychology professor Chris French, the co-editor of Skeptic magazine, remains unconvinced. There's lots of claimed evidence for life after death coming from lots of different sources. The debate should be about the quality of the evidence. At the moment, on the basis of the available evidence, I'm not at all convinced that there is such a thing as life after death. I think the sceptics regard the possibility of the survival of human consciousness as inherently so impossible that anyone must be rather crazy to believe it. But when you look at the evidence, you have to ask yourself whether you'd be even more crazy not to believe it or to find some alternative explanation which makes any sort of sense. And I haven't found one. When we die, we go into another world. A lot of worlds. 3,665 3, worlds. Because uh, I, I read it in the Bible. News of the amazing events at Skoll spread around the world. In 1997, they were invited to hold sessions in four European countries and the United States. Some of the most successful sessions occurred in the Los Angeles home of Brian Hurst. We wanted to see whether it could also take place so many thousands of miles away from Skoll here in Southern California. Hurst's converted garage was the venue for eight sessions. As many as 30 people attended each one. Hi! Oh, hi. Hello, Cynthia. Hi, nice how to are see you? you. Great. Before each session, investigators carefully inspected the room. Many people went in at different times before the sessions and there was no, no paraphernalia, there was nothing hidden there at all. Despite being interviewed a decade after the Skoll experiment, these witnesses are still profoundly moved by what they saw. There was so much phenomena going on, it was really overwhelming. As with most sessions, visitors began by sitting quietly in total darkness. Then, they started hearing the voices of this spirit team speaking through the mediums. Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Marie. 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 Then the darkened room burst into life. Is that cool? Yeah. 
Look at that. that is wow. Awesome. wow. Yeah. It's like a firefly. Yeah. Like fireworks. Wow. <laughs> and then it would go up to the rafters of the garage and come down and thunk hard like a big rock hitting the table and then disappear. <laughs> as well as these amazing balls of light, furniture in the room began to move. We had a, a table in the center of the room that had crystals on it. It's moving. The table is indeed levitating. The table levitated, was turned on its side and began to spin very rapidly. The crystals never fell off. Even if there hadn't been crystals on the table, it would have been impossible to have turned the table sideways and rotated it with the speed at which it rotated. And we could see this because there were luminescent strips on the table. And it began to spin around actually so rapidly it almost looked like a pinwheel. As well as familiar spirit communicators, other voices the group say belong to dead relatives also attempted to communicate. What? We're several hours early. We're, we're several Someone hours for early. Shirley. Yes. Sure, Gary, have that song. Dad? Speak to him. Hi, Dad. I really do feel that um, my dad came and he was the one who put his hands on my shoulders. Oh. Um, the way we were situated in the room, my chair was right up against a wall and there was no way another person could be behind me. Then another hand appeared in front of them. But who did it belong to? There was a particular communicator called Reg Lawrence, who was an engineer in his lifetime and who became very expert at producing voices from midair. Oh, Hello, Reg. Reg. Hello, Brent. Very nice of you to have us here. He just touched my hand. Oh, oh, yes. oh, oh my yes. Oh, oh, he's stroking it. It's slightly cold, but it's flesh. He's shaking my hand. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> you wretch, you've, you've made my ear. You've made mine. <laughs> As usual, Lawrence did not communicate through the mediums. Instead, the group could hear his voice projected from different parts of the room. Some of the voices were moving around the room, even a high up in the rafter area that uh, Somebody would have had to climb up on a ladder to, to get up there, and there's no way that that was happening. The spirit team also came to be regarded as healers by the participants. Has it gone inside you, that light? It's in my chest right now. It was right there around my heart, and I have a little bit of a heart problem. Wow. I was diagnosed with cancer, and a very fast-moving, dangerous cancer. I sat with school, and probably two to three weeks later, I had biopsies again and they came back completely negative. <laughs> All of the visitors attending the LA session said the experience changed their lives forever. When you walk out of that room, you definitely feel like you've been exposed to something very extraordinary. We actually saw the spirits. And that's got to be positive evidence for survival. We do live on after death. They certainly proved that to us that night. Being survived in Auschwitz, and also my parents were killed in Auschwitz, including my 11-year-old brother, who was killed on arrival, with my parents, and I just cannot accept it that they, that should be the end of them. Previously, we have shown how experiments at Skoll and with Bachi provide powerful evidence for life after death. But some researchers think there may be another possible explanation. Could some of the remarkable events shown in this film be the result of human paranormal abilities like psychokinesis, the claimed ability of the mind to directly affect matter? There's an enormous amount of evidence for the existence of psychokinesis. In the laboratory, we're talking mainly about the evidence of human consciousness on random number generators and very small events that can be totally controlled. There is clear evidence that people can affect things. 
One of the most famous practitioners of psychokinesis, or PK, was a Russian housewife called Nina Kulagina. Kulagina was able to demonstrate her abilities under strictly controlled conditions in front of a team of scientists. Researchers who investigated her were convinced she was able to do this solely by the power of her mind. So could the Skull Group and their visitors unwittingly have created some or all of the phenomena using mind over matter? As an explanation, although it's not more than just simply a label to it, this is psychokinesis in physical mediumship. Whether it is a spirit working through someone, a spirit acting directly on an object, or the medium's mind causing the things to move. Say there were real mind over matter effects going on as opposed to conjuring tricks. Um, then how do we know they were coming from the minds of the disembodied people rather than from the minds of the mediums who were sitting in the room? There is no definitive answer to this question. But the theory that these phenomena were due solely to psychokinesis from the living seems improbable, since PK produced in laboratories tends to be weak. Therefore, mind over matter from the living is unlikely to explain the huge range of phenomena featured in this film. When did you live on the Earth? Oh, a long time ago now. Nineteenth century? Yes. We simply have a number of clues of information which was extremely unlikely to have derived from the subconscious mind or the conscious mind of the medium. Uh, and the more impressive those are, the less likely it is that you can say that this is an aspect of mediumship. And the more likely it is, it's an aspect of discarnate communication. Previously, we travelled with the Skull Group to Italy, where they first met with Marcello Bacci. They say they were able to talk to the spirits via his radio. Come on, who's this? Come on, I'm here. Time stream. Time stream? Time stream. But when the Skull Group visited Bacci in a later session, he was having problems. For months, Hundreds of people who came from around the world in the hope of hearing their dead loved ones were bitterly disappointed. All they heard was static. Bachi was depressed. He feared he had lost his unique talent. Then, in an extraordinary piece of luck, as our cameras rolled in an interview with Bachi, the radio, which had been silent for so long, burst into life. Chiudete tutto! Cosa cosa c'è? They're coming the radio. They're coming the radio. Bacci's drought was over. When the radio voice stopped, there was celebration. Bacci felt he'd regained his ability to communicate with the spirits. But then Joy turned to disappointment as he thought he had failed to record the voice. Madonna, non è partito. No. No, era partito, l'ho spento ah. io, vai. Lo <laughs> ho già messo indietro. Ah, te. Ma mi fa sì. Ma non è tra di sicuro. Io, io voglio, ma me l'ho messo già io indietro. Entro. Once the recording was transcribed, Bacci told us the voice belonged to a spirit called Gregorio, a Catholic friar who had died many years ago. Later, Independent researcher Dr. Toriello read the last part of this ghostly message. Man, he passed his time just deceiving himself, okay? But when all of you, you will be here where we are, okay? Then you will find the answer to all your questions. I'm sorry, I cannot say more.
we do look down on our friends and loved ones after we die until such time as we move on uh, to some other dimension. I think uh, you can think what you like, really. Despite the evidence from Skoll and Bachi, <laughs> most scientists still refuse to even consider the possibility that consciousness might survive death. Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, the internationally renowned biologist and Skoll investigator, offers an explanation. There's a dominant materialism in science that grew up in the 19th century. It's become part of the culture of science, but it's really a dogmatic belief system rather than a testable theory. What this means is that scientists have become completely focused on the things they can both measure and replicate in labs. Within science, based on a materialist point of view, the mind is the brain. So anything that suggests the mind might be more than the brain goes against the theory and therefore most scientists don't want to know about it. Another prominent scientist not convinced that consciousness is solely the result of brain activity is Dr. Charles Tart. Yeah, but that's just a small part of the spectrum. Dr. Tart is Emeritus Professor of Psychology at the University of California and a leading researcher into the evidence for life after death. The idea that survival of bodily death is impossible and that we're nothing but our brains and bodies is really a function of an outmoded view in science, a Newtonian worldview. Now, the Newtonian worldview works very well for everyday events. But one of the most interesting things about modern science, especially when you look at stuff like quantum theory, is that the world is far more mysterious than we think. And we now have experimental evidence of what Einstein called spooky action at a distance, that we can instantaneously affect something in a distant part of the universe. That's really wild. If consciousness has any of the qualities of this quantum level of existence, then phenomena like survival of bodily death are probably not so mysterious after all. quantum theory explain one of the most shocking experiments conducted at Skoll. This particular experiment was perhaps the most important experiment of the whole series. Previously, we showed how visitors reported seeing these balls of light appear before them. On this occasion, one of them flew inside a large quartz crystal. The crystal then levitated. We could see it glowing and then descended into a, a Pyrex bowl. Then Arthur Ellison was invited to pick it up. He picked it up and satisfied himself that it was there and it was glowing, and he put it down again. He was asked right away to pick it up again. He tried to, and his fingers closed right over it. It had dematerialized. There's nothing there, yes, it looks the same, but there's nothing there. Then he was asked to pick it up again, and it rematerialized in his hand. Now this dumbfounded him. This is what finally convinced him that this was real because it couldn't have been faked in any way. And he had his, his head right over the top of the bowl in order to ensure that no hand or no instrument could interfere with it. Of course, we were totally amazed by this. Things do not materialise and dematerialise. This is against all the laws of nature. We are trained scientists, of course. We know how the world behaves, and it doesn't behave like that. Well, you really think what we're experiencing now? Yes. But what does this remarkable demonstration tell us about what might happen after death? The spirit team told us that the experiment with the crystal in the bowl gave a good example of what happened when we die, in that the essence of the crystal remained even when the physical part of the crystal had been removed. Our bodies represent the physical part, but the essence of ourselves remains the same. This, if you like, 
can be termed the soul. If I believe in the possibility of life after death, what do I think would happen after? I don't know. I just don't know, do you? <laughs> Well, I don't particularly want to have anything other than pure death, and I would rather not believe in survival, but I find it impossible to be intellectually honest and not believe in survival. Tragically, during the production of this film, Montague Keane died. But this gave us the opportunity of testing whether or not he actually got his wish for oblivion. This came in the form of Alison Dubois. Dubois has become one of the most famous mediums in the world after her abilities were dramatized in the hit TV show, Medium. That's huge. When things come through that strong, huge. you can't get better. We visited the University of Arizona where scientists were testing the abilities of America's top mediums. Here we challenged Alison Dubois to contact the spirit of Montague Keane. It's not the same. Um, is when you're alive. She was able to conduct her mediumship in full light, in front of the camera, with two researchers seated behind, asking questions. Do you have any idea who this person is? Dubois wasn't given any information about Keane. The only thing she was told was the first name of Keane's widow, Veronica. The fact that he gets to still be here around the people he loves is um, huge to him. Although many of Dubois' statements were vague, some were astonishingly accurate. He went down at a podium or... No. No. <laughs> um, he's showing a man falling at the podium, like... Like... And falls, and he goes down at the podium. Okay. Uh, this is important. It's so like an assembly. On the night of his death, Keane was taking part in a debate at the Royal Society of Arts in London. While defending his position, his voice faltered mid-sentence, and he died. Hey, you think it's going to just sit here? Sit here. Take a rest. Uh, no, that, I, I don't even know what it means. I mean, he's making me feel like either he had a heart attack or his breath was taken from him, but he's showing him knees buckling and going down. Is there a doctor in the house? People jumping up, like everybody rising. Um, he goes down and they go up. Right. Um, also, there would have been like a banner announcement or a banner hanging of, of what this conference was or whatever it was. He's kind of laughing and he's like, way to go out, you know, like way to leave this world, you know, right there and then. Dubois stated that Keane is now as interested in communicating with the living as he once was in talking to the dead. To try and understand better, like to understand the other side, what you guys are seeing that's right and what's not right, and almost to like try and help make that clearer. I do believe in an afterlife. Um, I'm not sure what that life will look like uh, if we just go back into the source but uh, I just kind of live my life like uh, we'll see when we get there. Although some researchers continue to question whether the experiments featured in this film represent convincing evidence for an afterlife, for the leading investigators and participants there is little doubt it does. We actually saw the spirits. Emily, when did you live on the Earth? Oh, a long time ago now. 19th century? Yes. I think we were pushing the barriers further than had ever been pushed before and I think we just got to the stage where at that time we couldn't go any further. In 1998, after five years and 500 sessions, the Skoll experiment finally came to an end.
The skull experiment may be over, but today, in Italy, grieving parents continue to report hearing the voices of their dead children on Bacci's radio. <laughs> And Vicky Talbot says she continues to receive the voice of her deceased son, Brayden, via EVP. <laughs> but the debate about the authenticity and significance of this evidence continues to rage. Now, according to science, when you physically die and when your brain stops functioning, that is it, that is the end. The experiences that I've had have convinced me that it is very difficult to explain any of these things by an alternative explanation to that of survival. You're not going to win everybody. I mean, you're, you're not going to be able to ever have everybody believe that there's another side. That's just not going to happen. I hope the significance of those experiments will literally be to make people think, to stop and think look at their own lives, to look at where they're going, perhaps to be better people.